This is a worship podcast for Sunday the 9th of May. That's the sixth Sunday of Easter. And I'm Nicholas Henshaw, the Dean of Chelmsford. I want to start with that collection of verses from Paul's letters, often known as the Easter anthems. It often feels counterintuitive that Paul is writing before any of the Gospels. So these verses are some of the very earliest responses to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, so let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven of corruption and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christ, once raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. In dying he died to sin once for all. In living he lives to God. See yourselves, therefore, as dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who sleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. But as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And here are some reflections in response to today's readings and the context both in this Easter season and in this strange interim time during the pandemic, seeking to explore what those themes might mean to us today. Back in September last year, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced the new job retention scheme. He commented that we now needed to adapt and evolve in response to a more permanent adjustment. What a fantastic phrase, to adapt and evolve in response to a more permanent adjustment. He was talking about the pandemic's impact on the economy, but I'd suggest it's also a fantastic strapline for this Easter season. Early Christian communities marked the Easter season in a whole range of ways. Kneeling was banned and the Old Testament wasn't read at the main Sunday gathering. Now, contemporary Christians kneel far less anyway. But we have revived the practice of not reading the Old Testament at our Sunday gatherings. Instead, we read the second volume of Luke's Gospel, the book we know as the Acts of the Apostles. Hence today's extraordinary account of Peter following his vision at Joppa, witnessing a new reality. Gentiles, that's non-Jews, can receive the Holy Spirit. This was not what what he was expecting at all. Acts tells us as a whole book how people adapted and evolved in response to the permanent adjustment made by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Acts invites us to do the same, to consider our own response. As today's psalm suggests, they and we are learning to sing a new song. The landscape's different, and we've got to go forward into that new landscape. The metaphor of new birth in one of today's readings resonates down the centuries. That is how big a deal this is. I'm delighted that no one was actually present, apart from some sleeping guards, to witness the moment of the resurrection. That's partly because writing it down might well have made it sound ridiculous, much as Luke's account of the Ascension does, a pair of feet sticking out of a cloud, as sometimes it's painted. How do you capture, in human language, an event that transcends human language? But there is more. The testimony we do have to the resurrection is, of course, from the impact of the risen Christ on those who meet him. The permanent adjustment, so to speak, that the risen Christ makes to their lives and in turn to our lives, to us who have received their testimony. We have, dare I say it, perhaps accidentally trivialised the death and resurrection of Jesus. We carelessly speak as if they were two events, with Easter morning somehow putting right what happened on Good Friday afternoon. Like a Hollywood happy ending, on Easter morning we can heave a great big sigh of relief that it all turned out okay, God's in his heaven and everything's right with the world. The church of the first five centuries would have absolutely none of this. They would tell us very clearly that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a single saving event. And the fact that, as both Luke and John go out of their way to emphasise, the risen Christ is still wounded, indeed is recognised as the risen Christ because of his wounds, makes that clear. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a single saving event. The self-emptying of God that reaches its climax on the cross is a permanent characteristic of God, 
not something that's cancelled out on Easter Day. And if the risen Christ is still wounded, then the Christ who ascends to the Father's side is still wounded, still bleeds for love of our love. If the death and re resurrection of Jesus Christ is a single event, a single saving event, then what is the scope of that salvation? Well, Peter, in today's reading from Acts, has just found out. Whatever limits he was expecting, salvation just for Jews perhaps, or just for those who live in a particular way, or whatever definition, whatever line in the sand you have, well, all of that gets turned on its head when Peter witnesses Cornelius and his household receive the Holy Spirit, something that up till now Peter would have thought of as, well, impossible and frankly abhorrent. To reference John's Gospel, the, spoke, the scope of God's salvation is the whole created order. Just as God's covenant with Noah in the book of Genesis was explicitly a covenant with the whole created order, so in the Gospels. John 3.17, which uh, I'd regard as one of the most important verses in the whole of the Gospels. If you translate it very literally, it goes like this. God did not send his son into the cosmos to condemn the cosmos, but in order that the cosmos might be saved through him. That is the permanent adjustment that the death and resurrection of Jesus makes and to which we are invited to respond. Certainly, the death and resurrection of Jesus changes the nature of what it means to be human, but it is cosmic in its implications. Drawing on Peter's letters and enshrined in the Apostles' Creed, the early centuries of the church, and indeed Eastern Christians today, visualise the resurrection, and you'll see it on your screen if you're able to see the video, as a, a, a blindingly white-clothed Christ, breaking the doors of hell forever, and grasping a symbolic Adam and a symbolic Eve by the wrists and hauling them into glory. And of course, this risen Christ always in those early depictions, still bears the wounds of the cross in his hands, his feet, and his side. Ah, this is the point of the death and resurrection of Jesus, this single saving event. This, as John 3.17 tells us explicitly, is God's purpose. For God has set us free, is setting us free, and will set us free. God has saved us, is saving us, and will save us. God has loved us from the foundation of the world, is loving us now, and will love us for eternity. At the end of John Milton's great poem, Paradise Lost, Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden of Eden, but they go on their way in the full assurance that the future is already secured. That is the gift out of which we are invited to live, the permanent adjustment that God has made to the whole created order. I'm going to finish with an ancient Christian prayer for the blessing of the Easter candle, still in use in common worship today. Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, all time belongs to you and all ages. To you be glory and power through every age and forever. Amen.